Hello, everyone. Um, those of you who are here, um, welcome to our webinar. We'll officially be starting in probably three to five minutes uh, while we wait for everyone to log on. Uh, we'll see you then. Thank you so much. Hello everyone and welcome to our ninth and possibly last webinar of our FOCAP sponsored series, Gallery Conversations. Uh, we are talking about a couple of additional possibilities for virtual programs and we'll certainly let you know about that as soon as possible. Uh, today we are pleased to present a closer look at the exhibition Breathtaking. It's a beautiful display that is currently on view at the Museum of Art on Santa Fe's Plaza. There are 18 artists and 45 individual pieces of work in the show. Um, and Mark White, our executive director of the Museum of Art has this to say about Breathtaking. The act of respiration has become increasingly complicated in American culture. Breathtaking not only takes into account recent events, but also the philosophical and spiritual ramifications of breath. And we are today incredibly for to have an in-depth conversation between Catherine Ware, who is the curator for Breathtaking, and Jill O'Brien, one of the artists featured in the exhibition. 
I would also like to take a moment to everyone to see this exhibit in person. There are just so many intriguing and subtle aspects to the show and much of the work that is shown and it needs to be seen up close and personal. I was able to go this past weekend to see it and was so incredibly glad I did. The museum felt really safe and uncrowded. But if you do need to wait just a little bit longer for safety's sake, this exhibition is open until September 5th, 2021. But I urge you not to wait, go as soon as possible. Also a small reminder that this is meant to be an interactive conversation with all of you. And at some point during Kate and Jill's conversation, you should all be encouraged to submit questions through the Q&A link. You'll find it at the bottom right of your Zoom screen. Just scroll over it and it, it will pop up if you don't see it right away. We'll be monitoring these throughout the presentation. And we also realize that some of you are joining us today as guests of FOCAP and our members. And we would certainly love it if you might consider becoming a member. There are so many benefits. They can be tough to keep track of, but they include artist studio tours, art focused field trips, house parties, and educational opportunities like these virtual conversations, and many, many more. FOCAP has also sponsored more than 35 exhibitions at the museum and will be involved in upcoming activities at the new Vladim Contemporary opening in 2022. The easiest way to join is to contact Kristen Graham and the Museum of New Mexico Foundation. You'll find her email address on the slide in front of you. You can also look for our webpage at museumfoundation.org. And now I'm extremely pleased to introduce you to Catherine Ware, who is Senior Curator of Photography at the Museum of Art. And her creativity, planning, and expertise made this very unique exhibition come to fruition. Kate has had an extensive career in museums such as the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the J. Paul Getty, the Oakland Museum, and several other institutions. Specializing primarily in American and European photography of the early 20th century, she has organized and written about many exhibitions, both historic and contemporary. Kate is now researching a possible future exhibit on mixed media photography from the 1960s and 70s. Catherine Ware will introduce Jill O'Brien, whose work is a core part of breathtaking. I'm looking forward to their conversation and learning much more about Jill and her art practice. Welcome Catherine and Jill, and thanks for being here. Thank you so much, Sean, for that nice introduction and your kind words, and especially for encouraging people to see the exhibition. And Jill's work in particular is very nuanced. And so ideally it is seen in person where we'll do our best with the reproductions tonight and that'll give you a really good taste of it. But it's something you want to spend some quiet time with and really enjoy all the aspects of. So it's wonderful to have all of you with us tonight. I am not going to give too much of an introduction of Jill because nothing that I say will be nearly as interesting as what she has to say tonight. And, and I know that because I've been talking with her. So Jill is coming to us live from Las Vegas, New Mexico. And uh, welcome to you, Jill. Nice to have you here. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Yeah. So some of, some of you who are local may have seen uh, Jill's exhibition, Mapping Resonance, which was on view at the Center for Contemporary Arts in Santa Fe in 2017, I think it was. And Jill has six works in the breathtaking exhibition. 
that we were just talking about, and she'll talk about those as well. Um, but uh, Jill, your artistic practice has been inspired by breath for about 20 years. And so you and I decided it would be interesting to go back to the beginning and talk about really what what stimulated that. So, and I'm gonna be operating slides too. So if you see me shuffling around and looking down audience, you'll know that I'm just keeping up, trying to keep up. So yeah, welcome Jill. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me, Kate, and also the people at FOCA. And thank you, everybody, for coming to listen, turning on your computers to listen. <laughs> and our Cracker Jack behind the scenes, scenes team. We always appreciate what you yes, do. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So um, should we start with the first slide? Yes, so let's see. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And um, we were interested in thinking about where it all began and how it all began. So is everyone seeing the, uh, the slide of Jill's work? Yes, I see. Yeah. Good. I see it. So I'm assuming everyone else does. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so. Um, yeah, so we, so Kate and I have been talking and we decided to contextualize the work in the exhibition by talking about um, the, the breath drawings from the beginning. And so I've included this slide because this is the first really significant breath drawing that I made. It took me five years to make this drawing. Um, the, the installation shot you see is at the Kramarski Foundation, which was at 560 Broadway in New York. It's no longer there, but, and I really miss it. It was a very dynamic place. But this was a period of time, it was around 2000. Uh, I was in transition and really searching for a way to communicate through art making something both personal but also shared, essential, primal, and, and experiential, some sort of a universal experience. So around this time also, I began to meditate and really to understand what that meant. And it was just sort of an intuitive moment in my studio when I thought about combining the two. And this drawing um, is 40,000 breaths. I started at the top left corner and worked left to right, top to bottom, like you read, like you write. And um, the drawings are, so, so while I was making this drawing, I was actually really working out what this meant what it meant to do something so rigorous as counting your breaths and also performing something of such repetition. Um, yeah, it is. It's a performance and it is uh, a very demanding activity as I understand it. Yeah, yeah, it is. Well, th well, this one took me five years to complete. So I was really kind of, I was working it out. And I was also working out, coming to terms with whether or not I was sort of up to the task, you know, of, of taking this project on and creating something so minimal. Um, but the but I liked that the breath drawings were I was excited about finding this new process and I liked that they were both conceptual as well as process oriented. So the breath they're made in marathon se sessions um, with a prolonged focus on breath breathing with each breath one, meaning one inhale and one exhale a mark that in turn records a moment lasting the duration of that breath. And so that's important because the drawings are as much about time and recording time as they are about uh, the body breathing. So key is that 
the recording of time and duration is dictated by the body. So the body is at the center of making these drawings. While I make them, I'm also acutely aware of the microgeometries and that I make with each mark, as well as the collective geometry created with the accumulation of the marks. So this, you can see that this drawing is a grid, but it's an organic one. Um, okay, next slide. Yeah, hold on one sec, Jill. I'm gonna un unshare and reshare. People are asking if I can make it a little bigger. Yeah, oh, okay. let's find out. Yeah, let's find out the answer to that. But yeah, I love the uh, the 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 factor of you have this marvelous idea of how to manifest breath and how to archive your breaths. And uh, but then the question is, do you really want to live with that <laughs> for the rest of? However long, you know, it's that, that's a. I like that that there was a testing phase. That makes a lot of sense, and uh, but you were also really striving to to find your voice with this too, right? Yeah, I was. Yeah. I, I absolutely was. And and the more I make them, the you know, the more that sort of comes to the fore. But um, yeah. I was experimenting with different kinds of breath marks and different sizes of paper. Um, so I don't know, can you make that? So yeah. This, this is the yeah, and I mean, I'm always interested in how artists find ways to portray what we can't see, such as breath in this instance, which was kind of the inspiration for the show. And what attracted, I was interested in what attracted you to drawing, using drawing and using the materials that you use and then how did you arrive at this essentially uh, monochromatic approach using very simple forms? Okay, so that's a great question. So I originally started using graphite and paper because I thought of these drawings as archiving breaths. So the materials um, are greatly simplified so that the ar archiving process rings through. So in, I could go on forever about why graphite, um, it's this, this kind of magical material. I use graphite pencils and, and graphite and chunks of graphite for the rock drawings. And the pencils are actually made with graphite and clay, but, um, but primarily, I think we, should, we can just say that I really, I was really simplifying the materials so that the process became the focus of the work. Uh, all right, so this one is called line breaths. And I, I was experimenting with different kinds of um, breath marks and different sizes and shapes of paper. Ultimately, I, I, I sort of settled on square paper because I like the fact that one edge does, is, isn't prioritized over the other edge. But with this one, uh, actually with, with all of the ones at the beginning, what I would do is sharpen a whole bunch of pencils, different weights and put them in a tin next to me. And I would start making the marks and when the pencil got too dull or too light, I would set it aside and just randomly pick up another pencil and start working. So that's how you get the variations. And, and, it, and it really helped me, helped me stay engaged with the work. So that's, that's also part of it. Okay, so this is the first drawing I made on rice paper. The graphite completely changes its characteristics on rice paper. It becomes blacker. It um, frays the paper if you color over it too much. It, it, um, it goes through the paper if you keep coloring over it. It, sort of flakes off and there's a residue that, that is created around the mark that you're making. 
So um, this one is a thousand breaths and I put two pieces of paper on top of one another and I made a thousand breath marks in the same spot over and over and over. And it wore through the, eventually wore through the paper and then the, the mark making started on the paper below. And I think if you can, I, I don't know if you can blow it up, but, oh, okay. So this one, no, it's okay, go ahead, go to the next one. We'll keep, keep it moving. So this one is um, almost 40,000 breaths. So the very first one you saw, which took me five years to make and was a 60 by 60 inch drawing, has about the same number of breath marks on it that this one does. So this is the rice paper uh, with graphite and each little breath mark area was gone over 20 times. So as you can see, sometimes the, the paper was torn and went all the way through. And around each of the little breath marks is a, you can see a dark area. That's actually raised paper. That's actually the paper frayed away and the graphite collects in that frayed paper and then it, it, it raises up. So this actually becomes three-dimensional. And the, the other thing about this um, drawing and this process of, of graphite on rice paper is that rice paper, as you know, is really, really lightweight. So this, the, 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 the actual object becomes completely transformed through the process. The, there's so much graphite on the paper that it, that it begins to weigh something. It actually gets a weight to it. So it become, it's transformed from a piece of paper with graphite on it to graphite with the paper holding it together. Ah, yeah, I thought I was going to ask you what made you want to try the, the rice paper because it is so thin and, and there's a sense of fragility and then, the, but whereas the graphite is, you know, has weight to it uh, and, and that darkness versus the translucency. But that explains that it's, it's not that you were looking for something to hold that weight, but you were, you were transforming the paper with this other substance and um, kind of impregnating it, I guess, with, with the graphite. Yeah, it's almost like an alchemical process. You know, it really, it really changes. Um, and this was important to me at this time also conceptually because, so this is an installation, well, the, you can go ahead to the next one. It's an installation shot of the three, of three of these very dense drawings. So you can see how minimal they are. They're really incredibly minimal. But this was important to me because at the time I was starting to make these, I was also learning about Tonglen breathing, which is a form of Buddhist breathing that teaches compassion, where you breathe in someone's pain, transform it inside yourself, and then breathe out light. So I loved this idea of breath containing emotion, light, you know, and that that this idea of residue. So the, the drawings went from archiving breaths to accumulating breaths, accumulating mm -hmm. breath marks. And that, that um, was really important during this period of time. I like that distinction. And, you know, we don't want to get bogged down in terminology, but one of the things I was thinking about, you said minimal, and it looks like minimalism, the, the art movement um, that we're familiar with, but they aren't minimal in a way. They're, I think of it as essentialist in a way, or reductivist. And reduct, now reductive has reduced it, it, essentialist maybe, that you've, you know, you've gotten down to the, the most essential elements and it holds that world of breath. Oh, that's great. I love that. Yes, essentialist rather than minimal. Absolutely. <laughs> because when you 
walk up to them, they're like covered with this stuff. I mean, it's clear yeah. that, a, that a person actually sat there and, you know, did all this stuff to it. So it's, yeah, it's a very activated surface. And, you know, I love that uh, the subject of breath just kept drawing you deeper in. And so instead of thinking, oh, well, that was interesting and hard work, I'm going to move on to something else. You really um, just found, you know, new aspects to explore or new, new ways to explore it. And that shows up in some of these bolder forms that um, yeah. are evident in your work. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, um, and it, it does keep changing for me, which is what keeps me engaged. This is, I put this in to show there were, there were other phases that I went through. Um, these are also breath drawings, but I was thinking about um, geometry and space and um, they're created with breath marks. You can go, if you go to the next um, slide, right? So here's the circle. I've, I've made other circles. Circles are really important to me with regard to the breath, if you're going to talk about geometry. Um, but this is the first one I made. And this is X times 20, meaning each breath mark had 20 marks on top, one on top of the other. And X is the number of breath marks that create the circle. Um, Okay, so what's the next slide? All right, so I included this because this was a really important piece to me. It was rather transformational. It was one of those really dense black breath drawings. And, but I took it one step further and I started and I made larger breath marks over the top of the grid that was there until I got rid of all of the frayed paper and underneath was sort of left with a ghost of the grid. So it, for me, it was like a transformation of a tra on top of a transformation. Okay, next slide. And I also, um, uh, well, the one previous to this, I also did drawings where I, um, didn't fill up the entire paper so that you could see both of the materials so that they were both present. And you could also see the um, organic nature of the grid that was being made. Okay. Yeah, and this one, I feel like people can really see the, the texture and that's this yeah. uh, accumulation of the graphite. And it, I mean, it almost looks like a weaving, you know, with these little stitches. Mm hmm it does have that quality. They do have that sort of weaving quality. Um, and, on, and then I also experimented with other colors. This is white graphite on white oil pastel on rice paper. And, um, and, the, and, the, uh, and the breath marks are actually lines. So you can see that. And um, the number two is really important to me. Um, it's sort of like paying homage to the fact that we have two lungs. It just, it's just another reflection of the body. Yeah, I love that um, duality and that, that connection with the visceral in a way with this. And then here's another um, one of color. So if we have time, we'll talk about this later, but um, by now you probably guess that I um, am influenced by Buddhism and meditation. So um, in Buddhism, white, the, the col colors have, are assigned to elements. So white is the wind and blue is the sky. So these are both air elements. So whenever I use anything in my work, it's, 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 carefully considered. It's not just random. So that that's where the white and the blue comes from. Mm -hmm. And this is also oil pastel with uh, graphite on it. So this is a, yet another form. This is a book of, of 
breaths. And you, on the right-hand page, you can see these little really dark dots. That is a pin being put through the paper. And then I took gra a graphite um, rock and rubbed it over the top of the pin prick to, um, to show it off, you know, to highlight it. And then I closed the paper so that the, a ghost of that would appear on the left-hand side. So I really love books. I really love making books. And the reason is that they're like little kinetic sculptures, you know, that you control, right? So you have a, you have a relationship, you have an intimate relationship with it. And so here you can see breath marks from the top, from the bottom, you see the ghost of it. When you flip the page, you can see it from the side. So you really get a three-dimensional view of what what the process is. So I put that in as well because I thought that was important. That really adds another layer to it. I mean, we're we're already voyeuristically uh, viewing your breaths and the drawings, but to this is something that somebody would handle and spend time with and look through. And that, that's, I don't know, it's a funny connection between the, the individuality and the intimacy of breathing and putting that in somebody else's hands to experience. It's kind of a funny um, tension between those two. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's, it's incredibly intimate. And also the thing about turning pages is that you're moving the air. So this is all about sort of, it's another aspect of- uh, Oops, sorry. Oh, sorry. Like feeling I the air something. around you, you know? Feeling the air around yeah. you. Breathing oh, I love is- that. The, the breeze of the page and then you're inhaling yes. it. Yes, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Wow. Well, yeah. Well, so you kept going, obviously, and, and found some of these more dimensional forms uh, with which to express breath. And I accidentally just gave somebody a preview, people a preview of that there. You actually did some almost sculptural pieces, right? Right. So I did some a couple of text pieces. So through doing this breath work I, and counting my breaths, constantly counting my breaths, I discovered that we have a relationship to the number 1 billion, which is just this like gigantic number. I suppose now we have to search for one, a relationship to 1 trillion in the body. Uh, there are probably many of them, but I was really excited to find out that we had a relationship to this number. So um, I did this billboard. Um, well, and what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? A relationship to that number? Well, that you could actually that you could actually breathe a billion breaths in your lifetime, right? Which seems like a billion. The number of billion seems unattainable. Is a a thousand million? I mean, it's just it's it's such a huge number. Um, yeah, it just seemed it seemed it seemed impossible to me, but after doing all these calculations, and then of course I wanted to introduce a kind of an absurdity to it, a little bit of an absurdity to it by making it super specific. <laughs> so for my calculations, this is how long I would have to live. But, you know, I just made the assumption that that would be the same for everybody, so. What a great thing to encounter on your road trip, you know, as you're bored and, you know, restless and wondering when you're going to get there. And then now suddenly you've got this mind blowing uh, equation to think about. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was fun. I didn't put any um, identification on it. Uh, but the, and then and then several years later, I discovered that there was a little, um, you know, on on Instagram, there was a there was something about it. So this is um, uh, a piece that I did at the Phillips Collection in DC. It's um, mirrored chrome. 
and it's at head level as you're walking down the sidewalk. So as you're walking by it, it reflects your face. And so it's, it, you know, self-referential. Yeah, so what, and again, 1 billion breaths in a right. lifetime. Right. Yeah, yeah and so what, what were you hoping people would, uh, what would this elicit in people as they were walking by? What was your thought about what their experience would be? Um, I was I was interested in um, giving people that number one billion and um, letting them know it was attainable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is the body of work I saw when I came to your studio thinking about the breath show. I knew you had been doing that work and um, was an admirer of your drawings, but I, I hadn't seen, um, I hadn't seen this work. It was still relatively new at that point. So tell us a little bit about this um, iteration of your breath drawings. Yes. Yeah, so this was another, um, yet another. Um, form of breath drawing. Um, for these, hum saw the shape of the sound of the breath. So I started listening to my breath in meditation and then imagining what the shape of that sound would be and drawing the shape and using with breath marks. And um, so this is one of those drawings. It was very interesting to me because it was, um, it was like, it was like moving forward through meditation. It's, it was a discovery in meditation, you know? Um, well, tell us what hamsa means. That is a, a, a meditation well, hamsa, practice, right? right. Hamsa is an, is an actual uh, uh, mantra that you can say, hum meaning in, inhale, sa meaning exhale. And um, it's, a, it's a Buddhist form of, of meditation and imagining a sound as you're breathing and helping to keep track of your sound as you're breathing in meditation. So some, some meditation is about counting, <coughs> excuse me, your breaths. And um, this was just another way of approaching that. And through learning about this, I started thinking, well, I started imagining what Hamsa looked like, because I'm a visual person, so everything I do turns into some sort of a visual. And uh, then I started thinking, wow, you know, I could, instead of saying Hamsa, I could really just listen to the sound and see what sound that made and try to visualize what that form would look like. Should we see another one? Yeah, and then you can see another one. So, also well, it's almost uh, synesthesia, you know, you're that you're you're putting the, a sound into a volumetric shape, and it really goes back to to what you were saying about that visceral connection with the body, uh, because um, ah, where was I going with that thought? Oh, yes, uh, it, it's to some extent as you were saying, it's about your experience of the volume of breath in your body. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for saying that. That you nailed it. Absolutely. That's right. That's what it We've that, got this down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the other thing I wanted to say about these two drawings is that I started using the background color is indigo. So I, I which which for me is a really metaphysical color. And I wanted these drawings to to elicit that kind of metaphysical space. Um, there is in the British library, 
Uh, there are manuscripts of sutras that are uh, gold leaf on indigo dyed paper. And they're, they're just like absolutely transcendental. But my um, material is graphite. And I thought, you know, I could do this with graphite instead of with gold because graphite, so if the graphite again, once again, completely changed on, on the um, indigo yeah. paper. It became mm -hmm. really metallic and really different. It, the characteristic of it is incredibly different than it is on the other, other drawings that I've made. Yeah, and these kind of shift from that essentialist work that's so, so stark, maybe that's not quite the right word, but these almost have a, the forms are sensuous in a way, and there's a, a richness to them that's a little bit different, a little bit different expression. Yeah, well, no, like not quite. I think it, I think it actually refers to um, the movement, right? So you're really referring yeah. to the movement of the craft, the inhale, the inhale and exhale. Yeah, and this one's almost a torso in a way. Um, well, I, I was just really bowled over by the Humsa drawings when I saw them in your studio uh, as I was planning the show, and they're they're just they're so elegantly shaped. The the markings are so dense. Um, the graphite has a, a beautiful surface and tonality. And I was thinking, you know, it's no surprise the photography curator would love these uh, in black and white and, and you know, that silvery quality too. Um, so, and, and, you know, I love the incredible economy of means uh, that we've, we've alluded to. It's, it's basically you, a pencil and a piece of paper, and that's it. And I guess that's, those are the essentials of art making. Um, you're sitting there breathing. And so this, this is the work that we had planned to have in the show originally uh, when it opened in May, 2020, but it did not open in May, 2020 uh, because of the pandemic. And so the opening was postponed. And uh, meantime, uh, you were at your place in New York City working uh, but it was, uh, you were there at the height of the infection rate there, as I recall. So what, what was that like for you? Yeah, New York was really frightening in March, April, and May. Um, but you know, at this point, um, everybody's had an experience of the pandemic and, uh, you know, I'm, we're watching India and it just, it's like, apocalyptic, um, it, in New York felt like apocalyptic then, it really did. It was, uh, it was terrifying and we didn't have as much information as we have now. So, you know, it was- That's important. It was, it was, it was, it was hugely scary. And we just, we went into hiding. We, you know, people got sick, people died. It was really awful. So, um, what happened to me was I completely lost my bearings. I felt like the you know floor had been pulled out from under me, just completely lost my bearings. And interestingly enough, I found them in looking at the moon. So that might sound peculiar, but we have um, the space we're in in New York faces east and I could watch the moon rise in the evening and I would watch it move across the sky. And um, somehow this planetary motion helped me locate myself in the world perhaps because it allowed me to imagine something bigger than myself. I was able to lift myself out of my immediate surroundings and that particular moment in time. Um, well, and the constancy of it. I mean, the, the fact that the yeah. world was, there were things that were still going on while, while everything seemed to be falling apart. Exactly, exactly. And it, and it was very strange energy in New York then too. It was just, mm -hmm. so, um, well, this is this piece is in the exhibition, so people may want to take a look at it in person. But what, what where did the moon lead you, and and that that led to making this piece in terms of breathing? 
So I did um, some research and discovered that there was a technique called moon breath designed to promote calm and sleep. This made total sense to me because just looking at the moon made me feel more calm. So just if you're interested, the moon breath is you block your right nostril with your right thumb and inhale through your left nostril. Then you block your left nostril with your left thumb and exhale through the right nostril. So the left side of the body is associated with the parasympathetic nervous system and breathing this way um, is associated with cooling and the moon. If you wanna get really energetic, you reverse that and that's called sun breathing. And then that produces the opposite effect. But I really loved the moon at this time. And so I decided to do a drawing dedicated to the moon. It's a perspective you would never see. These are both, both perspectives that you do see, but not of course together. And um, I loved, I, I did this so that it, when you see it in, in person, the two halves of the moon are relatively the scale of two inflated lungs. And the drawing itself is relatively the size of if you, if you outstretch both of your arms. So it also has a relationship to the body. So that harks back to the white on white drawing that we saw as well. Correct. Mm -hmm. This idea of two, yes. yes. Are you ready for the next? Yeah, let's go to the next one. So, um, so like the hamsa here again, you're, you're dealing in the idea of a sh the shape of breath. Right, right. So, so up until this point, all of the breath drawings have come from my own experience of the breath in meditation, imagining uh, shapes of sounds, et cetera. But the pandemic really threw me into uh, a dialogue, a different kind of a dialogue with my breath drawings. And I sort of had a reckoning with them. And um, because I was really aware that the meaning of breath had changed overnight, sharing someone else's air potentially became lethal and COVID brought on death by suffocation. And then of course, George Floyd was asphyxiated. So, breath became this very powerful thing. And uh, as I just, opposed to you, in the normal time when we take, take it for granted. When we take it for granted, exactly. Exactly. I mean, it's always a sign of life, but we do, we do take it for granted. And it also became political, politicized, rightfully mm -hmm. so. So, um, so, so I addressed the shifting meaning of breath um, by going into this territory where I was trying to imagine the first breath, the last breath, and the absence of breath. So um, I challenged myself to this and I created these three drawings. So the first breath uh, had, had um, gold leaf on it. It's probably opti optimistic of the three. This is the, um, the shape of the sound of the final exhale, actually. And um, to me, the, the absence of breath and um, the final exhale, well, the absence of breath is a flat line and the final exhale has just a slight curve on each of the edges. And in both of these drawings, there's a, there's a, a bit of a horizon. Um, for, me, the, uh, for me, the void or 
the idea of endlessness and vastness is the idea of an endless horizon. So um, that's what I created. Now also in this drawing, I wanna point out that you can see there's a shadow, there's like a shadow of a parabola centered in the, in the drawing underneath the horizon. So that's like the ghost of the memory of the last breath. And then the flat line is the absence of breath. Well, and I think I reconnected with you in the, uh, the late summer, early fall, when you had been working on these and your journey with them, if I can use that term, kind of mirrored what we were thinking about with the show. Suddenly the show that had been about in some ways, the the health and and um, health giving qualities of breath and the meditative quality of breath and the con contemplative aspect of the show were really uh, still valid, but uh, we felt like we really had to make some changes and include work that had been made in 2020 specifically in response to this. Um, the shift away, a uh, shift of uh, our attitudes toward breath away from uh, life giving to uh, life threatening and, uh, and the taking away of people's breath. So, you know, it's not something we usually do is uh, change the show part way through. It's, uh, it <laughs> the show was pretty much done, uh, but it was a compelling enough reason that we're doing a show about breath during, during a pandemic and uh, during a, um, you know, a new, um, a new look at civil rights and some of those issues. So, so we did go ahead and include uh, these pieces. But you also did um, work specifically about George Floyd Jr. and um, his experience. And of course, now we've gotten uh, through the trial uh, about his death. And uh, that brings us to another point. But um, I love that you were interested in trying to experience that interval of time that uh, when he was deprived of breath and, and trying to imagine that in some ways or visualize that in some ways. Yes, so, I would, so there were several things about this that were uh, really moving to me. One was, um, the day after, I think it was the day after he was murdered, his brother went to the site and knelt with a whole group of people on the ground for eight minutes and 46 seconds, which is, which is the time we thought that uh, it, it, his asphyxiation, his murder lasted. Now we know it's even longer, nine minutes and 29 seconds. But at that time, that's, that's what we thought it was. And um, also by the BLM uh, protests. So in New, York, in New York, I was really close to them. They were happening in my neighborhood. There were, yeah. there were a lot of cries of, you know, uh, they, were, they were clearly um, events of mourning as well yeah. as protests. They were clearly honoring George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and all the Countless other others. Yes. Um, and, and, and also mourning their losses. And they were doing that by the call was to say their names, to name the names of the people who'd been murdered. And, you know, I, I found that incredibly powerful. And I wanted to, I wanted to say his name in a way that I thought was meaningful and that, you know, participated in the collective mourning. So um, the first one, you should go back to the first one. The first George Floyd slide. This one is, is I, I timed myself for eight minutes, 48 seconds and made breath marks and then counted the number of breaths, which is the number of breaths that he was also deprived of. Um, and 
you know, by doing this gesture, I was paying up, paying res my respects to him. Okay, so let's go to the next one. Now we can go to the next one. So further on in the, in the year, in the fall, um, I started thinking about this again and how to, how to move on from the more in the morning process and what that might mean and what that might look like. And the summer before I had been to uh, the Sanctuary of de Chimayo and, and um, gotten some of the holy dirt in that Sanctuary. And I thought, well, okay, why don't, you know, what would happen if I rubbed that holy dirt into a piece of paper for the same amount of time for eight minutes and 46 seconds? and then collected that dirt and into a vessel next to it so that all of the materials in making the gesture were present. So that's this drawing. And that dirt is uh, believed to have healing properties. Yes, and so it is. That was, that was where you, that was the direction you were heading and um, mentally was, um, how to approach some kind of healing after a traumatic event like that. Yes, and you know, it just, well, we could go on and on talking about that. It just, it's like, and now we have another murder that looks like an execution. So it's, it's like every, you know, every time we try to move on, we get slammed with another really traumatic event. But, um, you yeah. know. Well, yeah. we're, we're close to being out of time, but I just want to, um, I, I was going to just articulate how this connects with some of the other work in the show, but I think we can let people explore that on their own. Um, but uh, uh, other work in the show also touches on uh, a different crisis, the well-being of the planet we inhabit. And so I wanted to just give you an opportunity to uh, briefly show some of your newest work, which we can see on the walls of your studio behind you, uh, which is something different from what we've seen tonight, but also very much tied, tied in with the idea of uh, the breath images. And let's see, yes, there we have one. Yes, there you have one. And then um, if you put up the next one, which is the green one is water. We should, we should part on water. <laughs> We just had water rain out here and the little and the, all the flowers are coming out. It's an amazing thing. Um, so these are called yeah. elk paintings. They appropriate the a color iconography of Tibetan Buddhist prayer flags. So yellow is earth, blue sky, green water and red fire. They're made by layering many layers of watercolor onto the rice paper. And the, the, the final shape, um, which loosely resembles a, a kimono shape, is a simple reference to the figure. What attracts me to this concept- It comes back is, to the body again. Yes, it comes back to the body again. What attracts me to this concept is that the, the Buddhist prayer flags there's no deity, it's from man, humankind, to the, directly to the elements. They're prayers that go out to the elements. And so the prayers for these are the, are the pigment. The pigment is the prayer. It's, 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 once again, it's a kind of a naming, it's a kind of a um, acknowledgement that the environment needs help. Lovely. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, Jill. There's a lot, we packed a lot into that talk, but um, let's do just take a few questions if you don't mind. And uh, Sean, uh, yeah, our FOCAP chair, Sean Gilmore, may chime in with some of the questions. She's monitoring one of the question areas and I'm monitoring the other. So, um, one of the questions was, how do you manage to breathe and count at the same time? 
<laughs> well, sometimes I don't breathe and count at the same time. Sometimes I count up the breaths after I've uh, created the drawing. So I create yeah. the breath mark. I do count, if I'm layering them one on top of the other and counting, then I do count like one to 20 over and over and over again. But when you're, when you're meditating, one of, a, a, one of the forms of meditating is counting your breaths. So, um, you know. Well, and uh, Pamela Winfrey was wondering, uh, because these works include your breathing, do you feel as though they're part of you, you know, even more than usual uh, with your works of art? And, uh, and also, she was just saying they really seem very much linked to time. And do they Im impact the way you think about the, the, the passage of time or the way you perceive time? Yes, absolutely. So what it becomes, time becomes organic because time becomes, time is linked to your body while I'm making them. Time is about collecting breaths. It's about um, the duration of one breath. So it's completely organic and completely linked to the body and how it's breathing that day. So, you know, if you, if you, if you pay attention to your breath, you get, you, you discover without trying to control it, you discover that you'll have sometimes, some days you'll breathe really shallow and you'll breathe faster. Other days you'll breathe deeper and longer. And um, that's, that's kind of what your time is like. That's the measure. By the body. It also, also, it keeps you in the present. That seems like the really tough part is you, it takes an intense amount of concentration, as I understand from you, doesn't it, to make these because you're just trying to stay with the breath and the mark, the breath and the mark. That's true. That's true. But while, you're, while you're making them, you know, when you're, when you're making a drawing, you're really engaged in it and you are in the present. It's like being in the mode when you're an athlete, you know, or anything that you do that you're really engaged in keeps you there. We have another yeah. question um, that I think relates to so much of this uh, from Sarah Bender, Osborne Bender. Uh, she says, this might be a very Western question but do you consider the breath drawings to be autobiographical or a form of self? Dr. The titles give them a note of reportage or something like a journal entry. Do you see them this way at all? Yes, I do, actually. Yes, that's a great question. Thank you, Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Um, yes. So the very first drawing that I made that I showed you that took five years, I thought of like a diary. I could look at the, I can look at that drawing and see where certain things happened in my life. So they were, of your life. Yes, so it's re, they were, they are really, they are really intimate that way, yes. They are sort of like diaries to me, yes. Yeah, Judith, excuse me, I'm losing my voice. Judith Sims was asking, uh, she said, this is also considered, um, but were there breaths that were frivolous or silly or you know, did you experience a variety of emotions as you were marking? I, so I did, so I, and I actually did two drawings early on or I attempted to do two drawings early on that I called laughing drawings. And so I tried to like listen to something really, I listened to something really funny because I thought, well, okay, laughing is like, a, you know, a form of breathing. It's a particular, very particular form of breath, right? And, um, and creating lines that would kind of sync up with the laughing. And, I love that. Uh, <clears throat> Well, all of our vocalizations are possible because of our, our respiratory system. Sure. So I, that's absolutely on point. Absolutely, yes. 
Yeah, and Christine Hebert, Hebert says uh, one of the things that the drawings do for her is it, it really slows her down and she's grateful for that experience. Oh, thank you. Hi, Chris. Yes, thank you. Um, they require slowing down to look at them. It's true. It's and that was one of the atmospheres we were trying to create in the show was, was really to choose work and choose colors and things that would cause the visitor to kind of mimic that pace. Yes. Yes, and you did, you succeeded in that. The show is really engaging and it's got all kinds of, um, uh, some a range, a huge range of political photographs to spiritual, to poetic, to really, really sensuous. It really kind of hits the, goes the full gamut the exhibition. Jo Josephine and Peter send their love. Wonderful to be here. Breathing in your work and your thoughts, they say. <laughs> Thank so, you, Josephine. Sean, yeah, Sean, how are we doing on time? Should we? Uh, we're probably getting ready to close. Um, yeah, let's go let's ahead and conclude then. <laughs> one more comment here from Pamela Winfrey. Um, that she says the work seems especially poignant given that so many of us have died from lack of breath. Yeah. So that's a nice thing to close with. Um, yes. And to with, I think. Hi, Pam. Thank you for that comment. Yes, it's, um, it is poignant. It is, it is. Breath is. Well, let's just leave it with her comment. Her comment is, is better. <laughs> <laughs> so in closing, I think I'd like to thank Catherine and Jill for a really enlightening conversation. That's been, it's been so nice. And also I'd like to thank all of our friends and members um, for joining us today uh, and thank people behind the scenes uh, Kristen Graham of the Museum of New Mexico Foundation, John Agotchuk from the Museum of Art, uh, Liz Cruz, Carol Mirabin, um, the entire staff at the museum, and our FOCAP steering committee. All the members have contributed to these programs. Um, we're all looking forward to seeing you next time, possibly for a virtual presentation but hopefully for an in-person presentation. And please don't forget to stop in and see this exhibit, breathtaking. It's really quite extraordinary at the museum. See you there. Thank you. <laughs>